Welcome, John. I am really, really intrigued by all your studies on the physical and biological changes uh, that of mindfulness. Um, and the fact that this can be me measured. Uh, as a physician, I prescribe a pill and I get no complaints. But if I tell a patient, oh, I'm going to prescribe some yoga for you, I may get some funny looks. So I'm looking forward to your presentation. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And I can... <laughs> You know, as a physician myself, I can totally relate to what you're talking about. You know, uh, it's it's funny that uh, in in my in my anxiety book was actually just published last week that highlights some of the struggles I'd had my with my own anxiety around helping my patients with their anxiety because mm -hmm. medications don't always work. You know, for some people they can be helpful, but all of us can learn how our brains work and how our minds work. So. We'll, why don't we do a five minute crash course on how mindfulness can actually help us understand our minds uh, rather than, uh, than do what, you know, than try to prescribe a medication or something like that. I thought it would be helpful to start by just thinking about what some of the misconceptions around mindfulness are. I've heard a lot, whether it's in my clinic or in my teachings or even in our you know, research symposia, people saying, oh, I thought mindfulness is about, you know, getting rid of my thoughts. You know, how do I clear my mind? Uh, and in fact, mindfulness isn't about that at all. If we look at the ancient uh, roots of this, this comes actually from, from Buddhist psychology from 2,500 years ago. And about 40 years ago, John Kabat-Zinn uh, started studying mindfulness more formally in clinical settings uh, in the United States. He developed a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, uh, which was the most, uh, is the most studied uh, mindfulness-based program uh, in the world right now. And it's been shown to have effects on anxiety, on depression, on stress, and, and other things. So how does this actually work? The way that I like to think about this is, you know, it's about helping us change our relationships uh, to our thoughts, to our emotions, to our body sensations. So for example, in some of the studies my lab has done looking at experience versus novice meditators, uh, when we get caught up in thoughts, like daydreaming, for example, this happens about 40% of waking life for the normal person. When, when we get caught up in those thoughts, our brain gets activated, this default mode network. Ironically, it's called the default mode because it's what we default to. And we just tend to default to a couple of things. We regret things we've done in the past. We worry about things that are coming up. And when we get caught up in any of those thoughts or when we get caught up with, if we have pain and we start to get caught up or resist that pain, that, that feeling of getting caught up activates this default mode network. What we found about 10 years ago was that experienced meditators are really good at deactivating this default mode network. And when we've done studies with digital therapeutics to see how mindfulness can actually change behavior, what we found is it helps people change that relationship in a particular way where it taps into a reward part of the brain uh, that, that might even link up with this default mode network. Basically, our brains are gonna do things that are rewarding and they're gonna stop doing things that aren't rewarding. And the only way to change behavior in this respect is to help us, our brain see very clearly right now how rewarding that behavior is. So for example, we've done studies with people wanting to quit smoking and what I do is the first thing I have them do with, with mindfulness is to have them pay attention to see what a cigarette tastes like. And they realize that smoking actually tastes like crap. Often they don't pay attention to that. They're just smoking habitually or on autopilot. And we find that as people pay attention, they can actually start to let go of that behavior much more easily because they become disenchanted with it when they see that, oh, it's not that rewarding. We just published a study last week, actually, it was accepted for publication with people using uh, an app, uh, app-based mindfulness training for eating, where we had them pay attention as they overate. And as they did that, it only take ten, took 10 or 15 times of them really paying attention to watch that reward value drop to the point where they stopped overeating. So I think these are some, some examples where we can start to tap into these natural reward processes in our brains. And where mindfulness can really bring in this awareness, we can be aware, oh, how rewarding is this? Oh, how not rewarding is this? And it can also bring in, and I talk about this in the Unwinding Anxiety book, what I call the bigger, better offer. So not only can we see that these old behaviors aren't that rewarding, but we can also see that things like curiosity and kindness are rewarding. 
And that's the heart of mindfulness, you know, especially being curious about what's happening, seeing what's actually going on. So for example, if I have a patient who's anxious, I can have them get curious. Uh oh, where do I feel that in my body? Is it more on the right side or the left side? And that can already start to awaken their natural capacity to be, to be curious. And I, I will stop, but I'll just say that, you know, my lab's even found that we can get huge reductions in anxiety by training people in mindfulness, even using a digital therapeutic, using an app, simply by having them become aware of what's happening so that their brains start to let go of old habits like worrying and procrastinating and starting to form new habits of being kind and being curious. So uh, I, will, I will stop that five minute crash course on mindfulness and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, thank you very much. That was really interesting. I, I have a question um, because I, I read a book, um, just by reading a book, uh, it, it was on Indian um, uh, mythology and things. And, and he talked about living in the present, saying that the past, it's already happened. You can't change it. The future, you don't know what's coming. Uh, so why worry about it? You have to live in the moment. And, you know, such a simple phrase, such a simple concept uh, really changed my life because it really allows me to, every time I'm worried about what I've done or what is coming, I put it in that context. And that alone uh, calms me and allows me to make better decisions. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you bring that forward. I see this a lot with my patients with addictions who are struggling. They're like, I'm not sure I could be sober in a month. I'm not sure I can be sober in a week. And I say, how about right now? You know, We're sitting here in my office or we're on a virtual visit. Are you sober right now? Yeah, well, let's extend that to the next moment and to the next moment. And the other thing that I like about being in the present moment is we, it helps our brains actually learn because our brains will, they'll, they'll try to learn from past situations and project those into the future so that we can kind of, uh, kind of simulate you know, and, and plan for the future. Well, the best way to learn is to pay attention right now and see very clearly, you know, what am I getting from getting caught up in worrying, for example? You know, if I've got teenagers and they're out late at night and I worry about them, does it actually keep them safe? It doesn't, <laughs> you know, but if or we can see that, about an exam coming up <laughs> yes, or an, or an upcoming exam, you know, the worrying doesn't actually free up our brains to actually study or to get some sleep. Uh, so if we can stay in the present, like you're talking about, oh, what's actually helpful right now? Well, just being, being present uh, and can also help us kind of let go of some of these, these unhelpful habits. Yeah. You know what? Claire, do we have I any questions from the audience? So I, I, I have a question first. Uh, <laughs> so, so one thing that I do when I, when I want to take a nap, I take my 20 minute power naps, actually they're 23 minutes. I've optimized my, my nap time, <laughs> but I, one thing that I do, and I can't remember how I decided to start doing this, but it, it's mindfulness. It's what you're describing is I will close my eyes and I will try to listen to every sound that I can possibly hear. Right. And I try to be aware of my senses um, you know, I feel the couch, the feel, you know, what does the couch feel like? What are, what is the bird that's outside? What's that annoying, you know, neighbor who's talking outside? And I sort of like, I sort of make a little mental image of, of what all these sounds and feels, I, I make up a little story about it. Um, and I remember a sleep specialist at one point telling me, oh, well, you shouldn't do that because then, then you're paying attention to distractions. And I said, no, well, the distractions aren't the noises outside. The distractions are all the things that I haven't done in my day that I need to get accomplished. So, I mean, now that you said that, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm doing. That's, that, it sounds exactly right. You know, noticing them and not getting caught up in them. Absolutely. Right, right, exactly. Um, We're gonna be talking about exercise in, 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 in another talk uh, coming up, uh, but uh, I experienced that windsurfing. So when you're windsurfing on high wind, you have no chance to think of anything else except the water in front of you, the direction of the wind, and the strength of the wind and your equipment. Uh, so, so I find I find Zen kind of uh, experience every time I go windsurfing, especially in high winds. Absolutely. Um, one thing is that on on Friday we're going to have an event that extends this this talk on mindfulness, and specifically on Friday they're going to talk about how it is that you bring mindfulness practice into the clinic, right? Like you were talking with substance abuse disorder. Um, but what can people in their houses do who aren't going to a therapist because they have substance abuse disorder? Right now we're all 
in this together in COVID, we are all sort of stressed out. We have many worries and concerns. What are the practices that you can suggest to people who are right now in their homes? Yes, and there are a lot of options. So it ranges from in the moment exercises that people can do. One of my favorites is this five finger breathing exercise. I put a YouTube video up on um, to kind of explain the neuroscience of how it works. But basically, as we breathe, we trace our fingers, you know, breathing in, we trace up a finger, breathe out. And what this can do is kind of uh, crowd out these worry thoughts in our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. We can only pay attention to so many things at once. So if we're paying attention to the felt sensations of two fingers and our breathing and we're watching our hand, that's four things. It's hard for our brain to hold much more in working memory. And as we you know, take 10 mindful breaths, it can actually start to calm down our physiology. When those worry thoughts come back in, there's a mismatch in arousal. So if a worry thought comes in and our body, you know, it says, I'm worried. And our body says, well, I'm not feeling worried. <laughs> it's much easier to notice that thought and let it go rather than, you know, if, we, if, we're, if we're thinking worried and feeling world worried, then they just have a, have a party and we get even more worried. Yeah, absolutely. So in the chat now, you can see um, we've put a link up to the to that exercise that uh, Jed was talking about. Right. So we do have one uh, question from the audience. Um, how can we use mindfulness to change behavior? That's a great question. And that's one of the big questions that my lab studies. So what, you know, as a clinician, I, and this is related to your, your earlier point about how can we get these things out there? We've been studying app-based mindfulness training programs uh, and looking to see where there's, you know, can we develop and study uh, evidence-based trainings that are based on theoretical mechanisms. So for example, uh, we've, we've created and studied a program for uh, smoking called Craving to Quit. And these are apps that anybody can download. One for um, eating called Eat Right Now, one for uh, anxiety, uh, same title as my book, Unwinding Anxiety. And the idea there is we can give people these bite-sized trainings through an app uh, and these can, you know, they can help them understand how their minds work, gives them mindfulness exercises and gives them the systematic training that they can do, you know, at, in their own homes. They can do them in the moments where they are starting to get caught up in these behaviors because people don't learn to smoke or overeat or get anxious in my office, right? So it's actually out of context. So the idea was, can we bring my office to them into their context? And if we can bring it into context, it's going to be more likely to be effective. And just give an example, we just finished two studies, one with anxious physicians, where we got a 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores. We did uh, we just finished a study uh, that's under review right now with people with generalized anxiety disorder. We got a 67% reduction in anxiety. And just to give a sense, uh, we were talking about medications at the beginning. The, there's this term called number needed to treat, how many patients you need to treat before one person shows a significant reduction in symptoms. Mm -hmm. With medication, that's 5.15. So about 20% of my patients on average will, will show a significant benefit with the best medications. With this app-based mindfulness training, uh, it was 1.6. So a, a much we needed to treat many fewer people before uh, one person saw a significant benefit. So we can even, you know, if we target mechanism, and give a good delivery uh, vehicle, I, I think these things can be, uh, can be pretty effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I think that the, you know, when they ask changing behavior, you know, presumably they mean things like, oh, I eat too much, or I don't go to bed early enough. Like what are the routines that I need to change? Um, yes. But, but one thing that I find interesting is that, you know, we talk about addiction and our mind eventually, you know, right away goes to smoking or to drugs or to alcohol, but things that we do on a daily basis can be addictions too. <laughs> you know, it's so funny you mentioned that because I have a chapter in my, in my Unwinding Anxiety book uh, uh, called Everyday Addictions, basically, and it starts out, we're all addicted, <laughs> you know, whether it's, whether it's our, our weapons of mass distraction, you know, our cell phones, <laughs> or whether it's, uh, you know, going going on Instagram or going to the refrigerator mm -hmm. and if we can understand that process we can you know if we can understand how our minds work then we can work with whatever habit or addiction it is you know I think of habits and addictions on a continuum habits can be helpful like tying our shoes but if we're continually you know uh, the simple definition of addiction that I like is you know continued use despite adverse consequences so if we are continually going to the refrigerator when we're stressed there might be some adverse consequences eventually if we keep doing that. Right, 
Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, with addiction, the, the difference between wanting something and liking it can, can be, you know, those, those are two dissociable things. So you, you can be in a situation where you don't like how this makes you feel, but you still crave it and you still want it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I have another question in the chat. Um, one thing I did want to point out is that we can't really answer questions, um, that have to do specifically with brands, um, or with, with a patient history necessarily, because, you know, we don't know the the full history, but there's a question here, um, that I'd like to address, um, this mindfulness app that you just talked about to reduce anxiety, is it available to the general public? Yes, the Unwinding Anxiety app uh, can be, and anybody can download it. So can we put it on, we can put it on the chat, right, uh, Victoria? And that way people can, uh, yeah. can find it, perfect. Uh, I, I have a question about, about avoiding things that trigger you or to remind you of your habits. So I used to smoke two packs a day of cigarettes. Um, and um, the things that I, I had to avoid in order not to, uh, smoke again were bars and movie theaters because when I was growing up in Puerto Rico, movie theaters was the place where you used to go smoke. <laughs> so uh, it, does that help or or, or is that um, just avoiding the inevitable? Yeah, avoidance is so. It, in, you probably heard this term in AA in people who are who have alcohol use disorder. There's this term people, places, and things. You know, if you avoid people, places, and things, you're less likely to be triggered to drink. And this can also be true for smoking. I think smoking is harder. If you smoke 40 cigarettes a day and you have to avoid every single place and time that you smoke, you basically have to drop yourself on a desert island. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's the avoidance. Mindfulness is actually not about avoiding anything. Um, and you can see how that could be problematic with somebody that's trying to quit. It's about, uh, it's, you know, it's funny, there's this phrase, the only way out is through. And so sometimes our, when something's unpleasant, like a craving, our brain's going to say, make this go as quickly as possible. So we kind of run away from the craving or we satisfy it. You know, oh, you have a nicotine urge and you smoke a cigarette. But here, the paradox with mindfulness is we, the only way out of this is through by turning toward these sensations, by turning toward the thoughts and toward the emotions and seeing them for what they are. I, I remember a patient, this is when I was working at the VA hospital, I had a patient who came in and said, doc, if I don't smoke, my head will explode. <laughs> you know? So he had a really strong craving right in that moment. So we actually went to the whiteboard in my office and just started mapping out. I said, what does it feel like right now? And he's like, tightness, tension, burning. Is it getting stronger? And so we kind of mapped, it went up and then it crested. And he's like, oh, it's less intense, less intense, less intense. And he had this aha moment where he realized, oh, this craving isn't going to make my head explode. Mm -hmm. And when he realized that he could see, oh, these are thoughts, these are emotions, these are body sensations that drive me into smoke, but I don't have to do that. And that's one way that, you know, we got five times the quit rates of gold standard treatment with a, in a smoking cessation study that we did with mindfulness, helping people pay attention first, you know, how good is this actually? <laughs> how good does this taste and smell? And then also ha have them work with their cravings. And as you can see, it worked, it worked much better than we expected. So I'm seeing a through line here is of, of sensory awareness. Mm -hmm. from from what you've said right is is being aware of the actual physical sensations that are happening when you want to do something or you need to do something and and using that as a way to silence the parts of your brain that are worrying yes well i'm just going to be particular here to help our brains see the worrying piece because it's it's about relating to those thoughts differently rather than silencing them right. but ironic or interestingly or paradoxically even as we learn that those worry thoughts aren't actually helping keep our family safe, solve problems, whatever, they become less exciting or less rewarding to our brains right. and they will naturally start to fall off. So I would say technically maybe that brain part gets silenced, but mm -hmm. in practice for anybody, uh, it's really about helping us relate to these thoughts differently helping us see that they're not helping us. And when something's not helping us, we can naturally let it go rather than trying to say, just stop worrying type, type of thing. So I'm, I'm sure you're not saying that, but I just want to be clear for anybody watching or listening. Absolutely. Yeah. With the silencing, I meant more of the default mode network yes. and the silencing the, the default mode network is what I meant. Yeah. yeah um, so in the interest of time, we're just going to take one more quick question. Um, this one is about uh, experiences of uh, vomiting from anxiety. This is called um, vagal activation. Um, and whether are there are any techniques that you can recommend um, for all of us as, a, as parting words. 
<laughs> so here I would say um, map and I, we actually have a free habit mapper. Uh, if somebody goes to mapmyhabit.com, they can start mapping these things out. So this is what I do with my patients. I start by having them map out what's the trigger, what's the behavior, what's the result. So if the, if the behavior is vomiting, then mapping it back, what triggers it? And then what's the result of it? Does it actually you know, fix my anxiety? That part, part's probably pretty straightforward. And that first, that's the first step in being able to map these pieces out and then maybe even bring in some mindfulness practices when those triggers are present so that we can start to unlink. Because I'm guessing this could just be classically conditioned where you know, anxious vomit, anxious vomit, because you know, vomiting doesn't actually make anxiety better. It, you know, so it might've just been conditioned, I'm guessing. And so if that is the case, we can actually unlearn that by mapping these pieces out and then starting to bring in this mindful wedge that can help us start to uh, not automatically go to that behavior. So vomiting is an extreme example of this, but this could be for anybody. So for folks that don't vomit, am I turning to my phone to distract myself? Am I procrastinating? Am I going to the refrigerator? Am I going to the liquor cabinet? Whatever that behavior is, that can be mapped out and worked with. Fascinating.